Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about who God is today. Have you ever ran into somebody and they didn't know who you were and they start describing who you were in the third person and you're sitting there and you're watching it? And they'll walk up and they say, I heard about this guy so-and-so and and this is what he does. And hopefully they all say good things. Come on, people. And they start describing you and you're thinking, it's good. I mean, so far it's going good. And they start talking about you and you're thinking to yourself, but they, they, they know about me but they don't know me. And today we want to just have a look at who God is so that we don't just know about him, but we actually get to know him on a personal level. Because you know how many times have you heard things about somebody, and when you finally meet them, you realize, man, that doesn't seem right. You know, have any of you ever been described wrong or heard somebody described wrong, right? Well, same thing, I believe God has gotten a bad rap because I believe that people have talked about him. Everyone's an expert. Um, We all have said things and understood things, even in our own lives. We've grown and maybe have had misconceptions about God, but I believe he's gotten a bad rap because we've put the wrong impression and the wrong information about him. So today is all about seeing who he is. I want to just to start with Psalm 145, and then we're going to break it down a little bit. But this is such an amazing... um, an amazing chapter about God and his character. So let's just um, read it. It's, uh, we're going to go from verse 8 to 21. It said, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord, and godly, the godly will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might, informing all people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. The Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are oppressed. All eyes look to you and you give them their food at the proper time and you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his acts. The Lord is near to all who call out to him, all who call out to him with integrity. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth will declare Yahweh's praise. Let every living thing praise his holy name forever and ever. Isn't that amazing, God's character and how awesome he is? And um, we just want to break it down a little bit. So thank you, Dina. Um, I'm going to apologize. You don't have notes today. That's my fault. Uh, Just in our preparation, we just wanted to really take some more time, and we we didn't get it to our staff in time. So we will have it on the app, though, this week when the video comes out. But we want to just break it down and talk about what is God's character, okay? Because, you know, if, if we are talking about this God and we serve this God, we should really know what is he like? What is his true character? I don't want to serve a God if I have misconceptions about him because I want to understand who he truly is. So we want to talk about four of the main characteristics of God. And maybe you've heard these words before in these descriptions, but maybe haven't quite fully understood them. And um, so we're going to break it down today. And there are a lot of omni, okay? Now the word omni actually means all. Okay, so we've got four words we're going to talk about. The first one is omnipotent. So omnipotent, right? Omnipotent. We call it omnipotent, though, which means he has the ability and power to do anything. Okay, he has the ability and the power to do anything. Nothing is impossible. Okay, so then that begs the question of like, well, but God can't lie. Right? Okay, well, I like how somebody really described this. I like how um, in one of the commentaries it says, God is all-powerful and able to do whatever he wills. 
Since his will is limited by his nature, God can do everything that is in harmony with his perfections. Okay, so if his character is to, to be truthful, obviously lying is in contradiction to that. But anything that is in character of his nature, which is good, he can do anything. Now Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Now I want you to notice something. Because it says in Ephesians 3 that God is able. Everybody say he is able. He's able. Now we would think he is able, he's just going to go do his own thing. But notice what it says here, through his mighty power at work within us. Isn't that interesting? God's not interested in being the main showboat. He's interested in having his power, his mighty power work through us. So that we walk out as ambassadors or understand who God has made us and we start to have him flowing through our lives. See, that's the nice thing about God. He's just not saying, well, I'm going to do my thing. I hope you guys are coming for the ride. God says, listen, this is all about me getting people's, people's lives helped and changed on the earth. How does he do that? Through us, through people. And so as we look at this, he'll accomplish infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. See, we have this box that we think if I could just hit this level and God says no no what I want to do through you is infinitely more and infinitely greater and it gives us a picture of how powerful he actually is but yet he surrenders that power to operate through us now I want to make a point that if God is able to do anything then why is there poverty in the world? Why is there sickness? All of these things. We have to answer that question because a God who can do anything, um, why can't he just fix that? But the one thing that he, God gave us was free will. He allowed sin to come on the earth. He could have forbidden that. He could have forbidden Satan from ever tempting Eve in the garden, but he didn't. And you know why? Because he wants us to have free will. He wants us to actually choose him which is true love. If you don't choose somebody and you're just forced to love and serve somebody, that's not true love. True love is being chosen, being um, where you want to love somebody. So that's what God gave us. He gave us free will. So by allowing sin on the earth, it's the ultimate gesture which allows us that free will of choice. But the problem with sin is that the wages of sin is death. So we're in a world that's sinful, that also means there's consequences to all of those things, which means there is poverty and sickness and all of that stuff, because we live in an imperfect world. We live in an imperfect world that until we now get to heaven, it's gonna, we're going to deal with stuff, right? We're going to deal with um, issues. We're going to have um, you know, health, all these different things. We're going to get attacked because we live in this world. But the one thing about Satan is as much as he's out there messing with things, he can't create. God is all-powerful. He can create. He created everything that's on this earth. But Satan can't create. Okay, so he is not all-powerful. He doesn't have that kind of power that God has. All he can do is imitate or destroy. Okay, so every scheme he has is simply an imitation of what God has, or he is out to destroy what God has. But he is not an ultimate creator, so he is inferior to our God because our God is all-powerful and he's a creator. So how do we apply this knowing this about God? That means that he's big enough to handle our problems. Say that. He's big enough. He's big enough. To handle all my problems. To handle all our problems. It means that we must bring him your, our problems because he must establish the free will of us bringing him us, our problems. See, we think, well, God's just going to burst on the scene and do whatever. No, God's a gentleman. He'll always wait for us to act, and then he'll step in and he'll meet us. That's why he says, if you come to me, if you're burdened and heavy laden, I will give you rest, but you've got to come to him. He ain't going to chase you down on the parking lot. Come on, come on. Everybody that came to Jesus, Jesus helped. There's nobody here turned around, but do you notice Jesus didn't chase people down in the streets? 
See, God wants us to come to him with our issues and our problems. And when we do that, we're basically surrendering to him and saying, God, I'm way over my head in this situation. Let's, let's really be honest, because that's really the, the conversation we have to have with God. Like, I'm really over my head in this marriage situation, in this work situation, in this raising my kids situation. I've got teenagers now. God, I need some help. <laughs> Amen to that. So we're all in a, in a place where we're, 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 we're coming, but we're saying to God, hey, God, I need your help. You know, as soon as we do that, he steps in, but he won't chase us down, say, buddy, I need to help you. I need to help you. We have to come to him first. So without inviting him into our lives and without inviting him into a situation, by default, he has to sit back and um, can't step in to change it. So we're seeing the importance of we have to tap into the power of God. Now, the next character trait of his his is omniscient omniscient okay what does that mean he means he knows everything he knows it all if you look at first john three twenty, it says even if we feel guilty god is greater than our feelings and he knows everything you know god knows our thoughts okay you may think you're hiding from god but guess what he knows them and the thing is that satan does not Satan cannot read minds. He can't know our thoughts. He can only see what we say and what, how we react. So that's why we have to be careful what we say. Because he only acts on what you say. It doesn't matter what's going through your head. He's going to throw thoughts at you, let me tell you. But he doesn't know what's sticking and what's not sticking. But God does. He knows our thoughts. Even if you cry out to him without ever opening your mouth and it's in your thought, he, can, he knows it. He knows everything. Okay, so um, there are no secrets with him. So how do we apply this? There's no hiding from God in shame or guilt. Let me say that again. There's no hiding from God in shame or guilt. Whatever we do, he sees every step of the way. I like when I talk to people sometimes, and they say, well, I, I, you know, if God only knew what I was up to. I laugh, you know, you usually have a good chuckle right about then. He knows everything. In fact, he even knows how many hairs are on your head. So if you want to look at a God that knows everything, he is definitely the one. And he well, what, I, what I love about 1 John 3 here is it says, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. What I love here is he knows what we did last night. He knows what we did in the car on the way to church this morning. He knows what we did 10 years ago. But you know what? The thing is that he is greater than that shame and that guilt. So what he's saying is, you know, I know you're feeling that, but come, I'm bigger than that. I can handle this if you come to me because he, he knows it all. So we can't, we don't have to worry about hiding in shame. But the other thing about this is that God knows, because he's omniscient, he knows the big picture. I don't know about you, but for me, you know, I, I think I know it. I think I have my life in order, and I start moving it forward, and then all of a sudden something happens that I didn't know about. And it's like, well, if only I'd have known. If only I'd have known. Anyone else, right? It's like, oh. The thing with God, though, is he does know. So when we start learning to trust him and walk in a relationship where we're actually asking him how to live our life, when we're actually going to him and, and listening to what he's saying to us, as we start doing that, we're tapping into the big picture. If we don't go to God with our issues, if we don't go to God with our questions, all we're doing is seeing one piece of the puzzle. And you are extremely limited, extremely limited, because there's all kinds of other factors that play into that. But when we tap into God and when we start trusting him, all of a sudden now, we become a piece in the big puzzle. And he can start guiding and directing us, because he knows the whole thing. And he's like, honey, just trust me. And you're saying, but God, I, you know, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And he's just like, whoa, 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 just wait. I see where you're going. I can see the whole map. It's like a view of a whole, you know, the whole world. He can see down and he can fully navigate you. You know, to, to navigate from one location to another. Um, you know, for me, I know on my GPS, I like to see the overview. How many of you? Like, I like to see, give me the overview first and then break it down step by step. Anyone else like that? Okay, because I like to kind of have an idea where I'm going. Um, I don't like to just be told one step at a time. But the thing with us is that God doesn't always show us the overview, but he knows the overview. He knows the whole path from the start 
to the end. That's where it takes trust. And he wants us to trust him. So he doesn't always give us the whole picture, which is so frustrating sometimes. But it's for our good. He just wants us to take one turn at a time. You know, turn right, turn left, go straight. Right? So it's a, an element of trusting him. But when we know that he knows everything, we can do it. Now, the next thing about God is he's omnipresent. That means he is everywhere at all times. He is everywhere at all times. Psalm 139, um, 7 to 8 and 10 to 11 says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. You know, for the good news about that is God is always watching. God is always there. You know, the Bible says he'll, when we make him our Lord and Savior, he'll never leave us or forsake us. God will always be there. He can be intimate. And at present, there's about 7 billion people on the earth right now. Now, this is hard for a human mind to understand or even kind of even get comprehend. But he can have an intimate conversation with 7 billion plus people at the same time and deal with every little detail and issue and problem in their lives and love them intimately. Now, for us, we go, I don't get that because we, we can't talk to two people at one time. Are you with us? We can't juggle all our kids' schedules for crying out loud. And so we think, man, that looks like impossible. I, I still remember somebody came to me one time and they said, listen, this week I really need God. So if you could lay off on your prayers this week, I, I need some attention coming my way. And I looked at him, I said, listen, all of us can talk to him at the same time. In fact, he encourages us to do it. And he can intimately know, and he perfectly knows. I mean, think about seven plus billion people on the planet. And he says, he, he even knows when a sparrow drops. I mean, wow. He knows the hairs on our head. For some of us that have got older, it's a little less counting for them. Come on. <laughs> but how do, we get, how do we understand this God that's in everywhere at all times and knows everything? And is there willing, ready, and able to meet us wherever we're at and be intimate with each and every one of us? We, we, it, it's hard to even get your brain around that to understand that. And here's the other thing is you can't get away from God. There's nowhere on this earth that you could possibly go to get away from him. He is pursuing you. Um, he loves you. He created you. And the Bible says that he wills that none should perish. So even if you haven't chosen him, he still knows exactly where you are. He knows what's going on. And he keeps hoping and, and wanting and pursuing you. So there's no place you can go. So how many of you have ever heard this? Well, you invite a friend to church and they go, oh boy, I cannot step foot in church because if I step foot in church, I think God's going to strike me dead. Anyone ever hear that? Okay. The thing is, if God's everywhere, he could strike you dead anywhere. <laughs> right? So he's everywhere, but what he's saying is I want you in church because that's where you can actually get to meet me and understand me. So guys, he could strike you dead out there. You know, he could strike you dead wherever, but I'm so grateful that he is a merciful, compassionate God who, who is patient with us. Um, but how do, we, how do we apply this to our life, the fact that he's omnipresent? One is realize there is no running from God, but that he is everywhere you are. You could be in a dark corner at the bottom, absolutely strung out by yourself and still cry out to God and he'll heal you and he'll hear you. You know, God is not a God where you have to go through ritual to get to him. He just wants you to cry out to him. He just wants you to pray. He just wants you to, to, to uh, believe in him. And so that can be anywhere. And that he's interest, intimately interested in you is such an amazing thing. 
it's a humbling thing because we realize that the God who created the universe, who is everywhere, still cares about the most minute details of your life. And he loves you enough to just sit and spend time with you and enjoy each other's company. Now, the last trait of God is omnibenevolent. And that means he is all good. Let's say that together. God is all good. God is all good. So Luke 18, 19 it's a great story here because this guy comes to Jesus one time and he says to him, hey, good teacher. And here's how Jesus replies. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. Only God is truly good. Now, was Jesus God? Yes. In his completion, he was all of God. But he stopped this guy because we take this language, so um, uh, the, 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 this, these words, and we use them in places, you know, that they don't really show the picture of who God is. And here's Jesus saying, God is all good. Why do you call me good? In other words, he was, he, he was explaining to him and showing him the level of who God is and how much he actually loves and he cares about each and every one of us. See, whatever earthly picture we have of good only scratches the surface of God. And, um, you know, we've had some very good people in our, you know, in our world. And for instance, Mother Teresa, right, who gave her life to help children. And uh, we would call her good, right? Um, Billy Graham, who has seen millions of people come to see Jesus, to know Jesus. He's good. You know, he is a man of deep integrity and one of the few ministers um, who've had no scandals against him because he walks in integrity and he walks rightly with God. Um, another one, you know, uh, there was recently this uh, situation where um, three young guys in France saved a train from being shot by a gunman. That's good, right? <laughs> That's really good. Those are our human examples, but yet that only scratches the surface because here Jesus is saying, in comparison to the goodness of God, that's not even good. You can't even call that good in comparison to God's goodness. So how big is God's goodness? Like how can we start to get a grasp of this? Which is what we want to share a little bit. For the first one is in his goodness he loves. He loves. He is a God of love. And I know oftentimes we've looked at him as this angry God who just wants to get us, but no, he is a God who loves. He created you. He has good things for you. He wants to pursue you. John 3, 16 to 18 says it really wonderfully. It says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed by believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go through all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help and to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted, and anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without even knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind God, or the one-of-a-kind Son of God, when introduced to Him. So this gives us a picture of us, when we make a choice for God, God says, I love you so much that I gave my best that heaven had. That was His Son. To come and fulfill that, that sin offering for us, so that we could be in relationship. And when we come into his, in, in, and receive God, we live this incredible life. But when we re reject God, he says, you're already other, under a death sentence. So you were, we were born into a death sentence. But God says, I've set things up so that you don't have to live there anymore. He loves us how much he loved us. If God didn't care about you, he'd have hit the reset button a long time ago. Come on, somebody. And he probably should have with some of us. Come on, somebody. He definitely should have with people that really messed with us. But God doesn't operate that way because he operates in love. 
giving us another chance, giving us another chance, giving us another chance. Every time we come to God, he doesn't look at you and say, oh, not you again. <laughs> come on, people, because we do that to people, don't we? They've been three, four times taking advantage of you in their back, and you're thinking, oh, not them. Man. You might not say it out of your mouth, but I know what you're thinking in your mind. God doesn't do that. He says, I'm so glad you're back. And he just wants this relationship with his kids. Us not living, if we're not living a life with God's love in it, it's not his fault. It's ours. Because he's already done everything he could do. He did the biggest act of love he could possibly do by sending Jesus. So if we're not living in his love, what we've got to learn is how do I receive his love? Because it's there. It is waiting for you. Um, we've got to learn to better receive. Because he's already taken care of it. He's already done what he can do. And uh, we need to le learn to receive. John 10, verse 9 to 10. This is Jesus speaking. It says, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me, which is Jesus, will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture, which is spiritual security. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. So this is not a God who is here to take things away from you. This is a God who came to bring you life and life abundantly. Okay, he is a God who um, wants great, great things for you. Often we look at, you know, we think, oh, well, if I go to church, they're going to tell me all these things not to do. No, you know what? It's not about rules and regulations. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And when you're in relationship with him, he wants to protect you. Just like how many of you who have children have rules for your kids? Wow, I want to be one of your children. <laughs> okay, so none of you have rules. Okay, I have rules for my children. <laughs> and Sometimes they listen too. Sometimes know. they listen. Are those rules for their protection or to damage them? Is it just a sick game we play with our kids going, <laughs> this is going to be fun. I'm going to get all these rules so they're miserable. No, it's so they can learn and they can grow into some new things. It's the same with God. If there's something he's asking us not to do, it's not to take something away from us. Instead, it's to protect us, to walk us into better things. So when he's a good God, he is only has good. Um, it is Satan who is the thief who is here to take stuff away from us, to kill and to destroy. What I love here is that as Jesus says this, he says he'll give us eternal life, which is beautiful. What kind of God? Um, he is an amazing God to realize that he's thinking in terms of eternity. We think in terms of this earth and these few years we're here, whether it be, you know, 80, 90, 100, 120, maybe, however many years we're here, but he's thinking in terms of eternity. And he says when you live with Jesus in your heart, when you've accepted him, it gives you access to spend eternity with me, okay? Because there is a heaven and a hell. And here he's saying, I am a good God. I give you a choice. And it hurts him to see people not choose him. But yet he still provides a way for us to, to spend eternity with him. So the other thing is God is also a just God. And, you know, a lot of times we think, well, you can just sin and do whatever you want. And God loves you and he's going to take care of it. I want to bring some clarification to that. Romans 1 18 to 20 in the Amplified says it this way, for God does not overlook sin and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous, unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness suppress and stifle the truth because that which is known about God is evident within them in their innermost conscience for God made it evident to them. You know, there's a still small voice, and when we go down that road and God stops us and says, don't do this, don't say that. I know it's on the tip of your tongue. Don't, you know, don't walk there. God's trying to protect us. But he says, when we blatantly go out there as ungodly men and we're out there trying to cause division, strife, and all their moral stuff, God says there is a wrath and a judgment that will come on the people. That's not what God's choice is. But the wages of sin is still death. Now, what do wages of sin mean? If you work for an employer and you put in so many hours, they will pay you for your 
time, and it's called wages. The, and the Bible says, but if you, if you put in if you put sin into situations unrevealing and people don't know God and they just, there will be a penalty for it. You know, I, I tell people, I said, we don't think that the consequence is that severe because sometimes when you do things, the consequence doesn't happen immediately. So I got away with it. Yeah, well, you didn't really get away with it because God's not mocked. Whatever you sow in your life, you will always reap. So if you sow being a con artist, ripping people off, lying to people, looking for ways to manipulate people. That's what you're sowing. What do you think is coming for a harvest? You don't want that harvest. But what if you're sowing kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, patience, kindness? Come on, people. The fruits of the Spirit. All of a sudden, what will come back to you is other people will start giving you kindness, forgiveness and all sorts of things and 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 God will move in a in in a way that shows but see God's wrath people say well he's not he's not mad I said well he loves each and every person but he can't be around sin but if you ask him to forgive it and you say God my life's a mess I've really just missed you completely I'm 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 way off the deep end and and I just need to get my life Right? Can you come in and forgive me? And he'll he'll show up and instantly and take care of. He won't say, "Well, let me tell you what you got to do," because you way overstepped the boundaries. No, he steps in and he says, "You know what? My grace is available anytime you come and ask for for forgiveness and repentance. Anytime we do that. But if we go out there with this malicious intent, like he's talking about here, there's a wrath that God has. We don't want to be any part of it. I always say, God." That's why Jesus, when he hung on the cross, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. See, he showed his forgiveness towards us. And being a just God means he will fight for justice, right? Which means when people have wronged us, he's going to take care of it. And I don't think any of us want to have a parent or a boss or anything who just lets injustice go. You know, when someone's stealing from the office and it's like, oh, it's not, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Or you're being attacked at, at work and um, it's like, oh, no, we're just going to love them, we're going to love them. No, there needs to be a point where it's like, okay, we've warned, we've warned, we've warned, now action needs to be taken, right? That's the kind of God we, we believe in because that way we can trust him. We know that if we've been wronged, he's going to take care of it. But thank God that on the other end, when we've wronged, He's slow and he's merciful and he's compassionate in that. So he is slow to anger. But we do need to realize that in a just God, it goes both ways. <laughs> He'll take care of us and defend us. But he also realizes that sin has a point where through, after his mercy and compassion and everything else, there's a point where the consequence of sin must happen. And that's where he has to take his hand off and let its natural consequence go. But, you know, I, I like... You know, Tracy Strawberry says this all the time. She says, we can choose our sin, but we can't choose our consequence. You know, we can choose our sin, but we can't choose our consequence. We all want to say we're in control. But when the consequences come, it's like, God, where are you? Well, you chose that. You know, when you choose that life, there's going to be consequences. But 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, because this is the really, really good news is that for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. You know, without Jesus, each one of us will experience the wrath of God, either in the consequences of our sin here on earth or one day when we stand before him. But if we have Jesus in our life, the wrath of everything that we deserve, <laughs> that we should have had, gets taken care of in Jesus. He's kind of like your safety card. It's kind of like, whoa, okay, I got Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that, that the wrath of God was poured out on him in, instead of me. But if we don't choose Jesus, the wrath of everything else, we are going to have to deal with. We're going to have to face it. But as we come into Jesus and as we say, Lord, forgive me of that sin, now the consequences of the things we've done even can start to be erased. You know, there are, if, if you hold up a bank with a gun, you're going to go to jail. And you may say, Lord, forgive me, and that's all great. And he's going to help you through that process, but there's a consequence to your action, right? 
But when we start coming into Jesus Christ and realize that the wrath of God was poured on him instead of us, there is a grace and a mercy and a compassion that starts indwelling in us. You know, recently we just met some um, awesome pastors from California, and she was telling us her story. And oh my goodness, she was telling us some of her stories <laughs> of things she had done. But she was facing 20 years in prison. And she said that, she says, I was okay with that because they didn't even know all that I had done. I was actually should have been in for life. But what they knew of were going to put me into prison for, three, or for 20 years. And she says, I accepted Christ. And I realized I, I, was, I was willing to pay the price for what I had to do. But God started softening, on her, heart, softening her heart, giving her favor. And you know, she only spent three and a half months in prison three and a half months because she ended up working with organizations, etc. So when we realize that in Jesus Christ, the wrath is no longer on us, but it's on him. There's a place of safety. One of the best new, uh, scriptures in, in the Bible for all of us is 1 John 1, 9 and 10. It says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Everybody say all. All. Oh. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I think the best news is if we confess our sins to God. The Bible says that he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all. And so I, I want to give an invitation today. If you are here and you're not living for God or maybe you're in the Winnipeg campus or even online and you're saying, man, I've been wandering so far away from God, but I have this empty void in my life. I have this empty hole in my heart. Well, it's because you don't have relationship with God. He's the only one that can fill that void. We've tried everything else, but nothing else will fill that void in our lives. So I want to pray a prayer here. The Bible says that if we pray and we ask Jesus to come into our lives and we speak it with our mouth and believe it in our heart, that Jesus himself will come into our lives. He'll fill that empty void. But then when we ask him to forgive our sins, the Bible says that he washes them away like they never existed. Wow. What a beautiful exchange. We bring all of our pains, all of our hurts, all of our sins to God, and he, he heals our broken heart, he washes the sin away, and he gives us an opportunity to walk with him. Yeah. I, I don't know what greater gift, and you can't earn it. That's right. There is nothing you can do to be with, right with God. It's a matter of accepting Jesus. It's a matter of saying, God, I'm not all that. I've messed up. I'm, my life's not where it should be. And when we do that, God is just ready, willing, and able. And for some of you, he's speaking to you right now. He's knocking on your heart, and he's saying, listen, pay attention to this. Don't tune this out. I want to step into your life and do something big. And I'm going to invite everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes here in this auditorium and in the Winnipeg Auditorium. And if you're online, just keep stay tapped in with us because we're going to pray this prayer in a minute. If you're here and you don't know the Lord or you haven't been walking with him, and you, need, you know today that today is the day to get your life right with him. I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand with every eye bowed and every uh, eye closed. If you're here and you're saying, yes, I just, I see, thank you for those hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I see those hands. Pray this prayer with me. Let's all pray it out loud. Father, in Jesus' name. I'm asking, you I'm asking you to forgive me. To forgive me. I'm, asking I'm asking you to cleanse my life. Cleanse my life. Give, me a clean Give me a clean slate. Jesus, Jesus. I'm inviting you to be my Lord, to be my Lord. and my Savior. Help me. Help me. I, pray I pray in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 
We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about the source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.